Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can open your word. Lord, I pray for guidance as to what to say and what not to say. It's your word, and we're unworthy to convey, but you use us for that purpose. And so, Lord, may we be blessed this morning as we contemplate the object lessons that come from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title is From an Unchangeable Past to, of course, a Changeable Future. That is what we are. That is our situation. Uh, you can't rewrite the past, can you? You can try in your mind, but it doesn't really work, doesn't really alter the facts. But you can have a say about your future. You certainly can. And that's what I really want to emphasize this morning here. What would you be most, what is your greatest fear? It's an interesting question. And there may be varying answers. But if I gave you a choice between guilt and punishment, what would your greatest fear be? Both. Probably. When people are seriously ill and there is an awareness that life is only a passing through, you can see the prevailing fear that comes to the surface. And then you try to obviously comfort people. But there is that fear, either guilt or punishment. You know, the, um, the fact when someone is guilty, what we do, we find them in this country. And then, of course, well, all countries, really. And then there is an incarceration. You, you limit their mobility. But if we take away their freedom, we are punishing them. But will it prevent reoffending of the same offenders or new offenders? Is it a deterrent sufficient? What is the motivation that you, that you don't uh, offend? And I often wonder about the people that are incarcerated and when they've done their time, have we forgiven them? We've punished them, we're good at that. But have we really forgiven them? Do people get another chance? And I put it to you, often people don't. There is always that judgmental sentiment prevailing. Capital punishment, would that be deterrent? It's often believed it is. But the United States Department of Justice did a survey and they, they, they uh, well, they issued a paper and it was very interesting reading. Got some main points here. The certainty of being caught, I like to bring this to your attention, is a vastly more powerful deterrent than the punishment itself. To know that you will get caught, if there is an element of possibility that you will not get caught, you'll risk that, uh, if you like the, the, the act enough. But the certainty of being caught is a vastly more powerful deterrent than the punishment itself. Sending an individual convicted of a crime to prison isn't a very effective way to de deter crime, according to the department. Police deter crime by increasing the perception, even, that criminals will be caught. And that reminds me that all of us that are sitting here, we have life and we've been given for that. None of us paid for that. And, and we, are, we are answerable for the life that he's, God has given us. We somehow think that our life belongs to us. No, it doesn't. It is a gift. It's on loan. I think it's good to remember that. And when our time here is spent, there is an answerability. And we are aware of that, and it's the way it is. Increasing the severity of punishment does little to deter crime, because most who commit a crime think they'll get away with it, and then they don't. There is no proof that the death penalty deters criminals. And that is 
the United States Department, where in various states it still is being used. Look at Peter's betrayal, denying his Lord. Look at Judas' betrayal, compare the two, compare the two. 30 pieces of silver is not more, not the only difference. Peter repented. Judas regretted. There is a vast difference, I'd like to put to you this morning, between repentance and regret. There is an enormous difference. We know what Judas did. And I like what happened to Peter. I really, he never forgave himself. But Jesus forgave him. In the chapter by the seaside once more in the book of Desire of Ages, she sets out that despite his failure, Peter was not to be deprived of his calling. I think this is a principle that I'd like to come home this morning in this congregation. Just because someone has offended doesn't mean they can't be used by God or by the church working for God. I think, I think that's a very important thing. Look, look at what, what, what Peter, what happened to him. Peter was not to be deprived of his calling to be a fisher of men. He did, he became one. He did, mighty way indeed. And Jesus, in putting the question to Peter, do you love me? And he did. And by the way, Judas also loved Jesus. Can you believe it? He did. He did. She says he loved Jesus. And Jesus loved him. But there was something that was more important than Jesus. And that's where he went wrong. Uh, to the question uh, that he affirmed, feed my lamb, uh, do you love me? Jesus said, feed my lamb. He upgraded him and the second time he asked him, tend my sheep. And then he ultimately on the third time responded by saying, feed my sheep. I think there is a lesson there for us. The only way to get rid of the past, really, is to make a future out of it. With that, I mean that we learn from our past mistakes. We must learn from our past mistakes. And then be given another chance. Just something I'd like to put in your mind. The book of Zechariah is a fascinating one. Zechariah, the, the Lord remembers... I like the story. He has a vision. And uh, it's a fascinating one. The Bible in certain locations gives you tremendous insight in the great controversy. You and I are a part of a great controversy. Uh, as you are seated here, we, we are all part of it. Whether you like it or not, whether you ask for it or not, you are part of the great controversy. Can't deny it can't run away from it. You're part of it. And so he goes on to say, he showed me, this is the angel that he had been conversing with. He showed me Joshua, Joshua, the high priest, the high priest representing all the people, standing before the angel of the Lord. Now, standing before the angel of the Lord means Means, means ministering to the Lord. Now, what, what capacity was it here? Was it on the Yom Kippur? Maybe, I don't know, it doesn't say. Maybe it was meant to be. Standing before the angel of the Lord, and the interesting thing is that Malach Yavah is, uh, without a definite article, is the Lord. That is the one that we know as Jesus. This is Jesus, as God. He stands before before him, ministering before him. And Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. Satan is standing at the right hand of Yeshua, the, the, the priest, the high priest. So he's on his left, he's accusing him. And in fact, really, when you translate it from the Hebrew, uh, the verb, the, the, the root word, Satan, that means to accuse. Ha Satan is the accuser. And the verb here is used to accuse him. That's what he's doing. Satan is good at that. Satan is brilliant when it comes to accusing. There's nobody who beats him at that game. He'll entice you to sin, and then he accuses you. Oh, and he, and he makes you feel guilty. 
He does that very well as well. But Satan's real accusation is against God. Satan, through all of this, is accusing God. Uh, no doubt about it. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, Satan standing at the right hand to accuse him. Now Joshua was clothed in filthy garments. Now the Hebrew word here for filthy is, means excrements, human excrements. It is that bad, it's that vile, it's that offensive. Joshua the high priest was clothed with filthy garments. And there is a background to this. I always wondered why that vision was given to Zechariah at, at the time when it was given. You can, if you go to the first chapter of the book of Zechariah, you can date that book. This would be the second year of uh, Darius Hystaspus, or Darius the Great, or Darius the First. Be about 520 BC. They've been in the country of return now for some 16 years. They were sent by Cyrus with a very specific purpose, to rebuild the temple. You find it Second Chronicles right at the very end or the first beginning there of, of Ezra. They were meant to rebuild the temple. And then there was obstruction. 16 years later, they're still not near completion. And there's an issue because they have been opposed by others who've sent letters to the Persian overlords, which was Darius uh, at the time of this particular vision. But the prior one, Cambyses, had stopped the temple building. The foundation was laid. Even Cyrus had uh, given orders to, for cessation. It's very interesting that we get a vision of what's happening in heaven... And we can determine also by history, known history, what was happening here on planet Earth or in the situation of the Jews where they were. They had returned to a destroyed Jerusalem. The temple had been in ruin for some 64, 66 years. And it was one thing that had to be done. The Jews still had a probationary time. You go to the ninth chapter of the book of Daniel, you can follow the time frame, the 490 years probation. You can, you can de de determine the starting date. The Jews are still in probationary time. And Satan is trying. He is trying so hard to stop the rebuilding of the temple. He doesn't even want a nation anymore. If you only knew how much Satan would hate this congregation... You might uh, pray more for protection. Satan hates God's people. He hates. And so he had successfully stopped the rebuilding of the temple. It got no further, as was, as was predicted, actually, uh, as, as, as the, the foundation. It's a very interesting thing. There is going to be a submission made to the Persian ruler. Because... A, 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 a law of the Medes and Persians could not be revoked. Are you familiar with that? Ended up Daniel in the lions then. Couldn't be revoked. And so Darius gave the, the okay to rebuild. In fact, he gave the instruction to resume the rebuilding of the temple. And four years later, after this vision, the temple, the second temple was rebuilt. It's called the Zerubbabel Temple, after the governor of the Jews. It was rebuilt. And you can see that the history of what's happening there is connected to the vision that we are studying here during the ministry of Zacharias. Joshua is representing the people. Satan is claiming that they are not worthy. If only we had any idea how much we are opposed as a people, how much you are accused, every single individual here, how you are accused, accused before God. It'd be amazing. It would change a lot of your thinking. 
Satan is claiming they are not worthy, and he's probably very right. They are not worthy of rebuilding the temple and reinstituting the worship of the Lord God. They are just not worth it. And yet, there is a probationary time that goes all the way to 34 AD. And it's amazing when you look at the provisions that God made for his people. Book of Job. Can I ask the question, does anybody know what Job means, Eov? I know I've said it a number of times here. Sometimes I wonder how much is hanging in there. <laughs> Sometimes I think it goes, Zzz. what does the name Job mean, Eov? Hey, I did hear it. Who said it? Oh, see, you must have a good teacher, lady. If she doesn't get it, who would? Hate it. Hate it by whom? Yeah, by Satan. Satan couldn't claim this planet. You have a guy like Job. It's amazing. The question that is, there are two meetings recorded. I wish there were three. I would have loved to have seen a narrative of the third meeting when the integrity of Job was preserved even after the physical infliction. But it's not there. I'll, I'll hear about it when I reach the site that we're all aiming for. Anyway, there were two meetings and there were challenges made to God by Satan. And I just wondered, what if God would have refused to accommodate Satan by allowing Job to be tested? What would have happened? Well, there's a universe there that is learning from this planet. They are learning from you, from me. They're learning how God acts and interacts with us. By the way, this little vision pertains to a, uh, an explanation that there are tremendous resources that God employs for our well-being that are involved in the salvation of each and every person here. I think sometimes we just have no idea of what is involved. I know, I know the sacrifice has been made. I know the right to sanctify us has been affected. There's no question about it. I know there will be a judgment and we'll have an advocate with the Father. But what goes into the salvation of a single person is still underestimated. And it is an object lesson for the whole of the universe. Mount Moriah, I must have spoken on this. I just spoke on it uh, the other week at an, another place. Mount Moriah, you, you know what it means? Moriah, Moria, Har Moria, Mount Moriah. I have told you this. <laughs> I have. I was going to ask for my money back. <laughs> Come on, someone must know. Moray is teacher, Mori is my teacher. Yeah? Ya yeah is the abbreviated form of Yeva, the covenant keeping name of God. The Lord, normally translated. The Lord is my teacher. Of course, the verb to be in the present tense is doesn't exist in the Hebrew, so it is implied. The Lord is my teacher. What did God teach at Mount Moriah? Oh, absolutely. And who was he teaching? But by extension... As Abram passed it on, the one who recorded it, the one who read the recordings of Moses, the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 22, a whole universe that looked on, oh, a whole universe that looked on. That mountain is also called Mount Zion. That comes with the word Zion from that one, which is meaning most elevated. 
There's a building there. If you ever wondered what site that is, that is of interest to us. It's been there since about 700 AD. And it's called the, in, in, in Arabic, and I hope that we have Arabic speaking here because the Kubut Asakhra, that is not a bad pronunciation if I may say so myself. I, I, I was there many times because I lived just around the corner. And it's, it's an incre incredible, uh, interesting building. The third most holy site of Islam is right on Mount Moriah where the temple used to be. When people, evangelicals, are hoping that the Jews are going to accept the commission to uh, re-evangelize the world, and that's the hope and that's in vain. It's not going to happen. There will never be a rebuilding of the temple. There won't be. Probationary time has closed. When the Jews nailed him to the cross, they nailed their temple to the cross. Finished. Won't happen again. But it's an interesting story and an interesting reality. So Abram, Abram sacrifices Isaac. Isaac is about 20 years of age. That makes Abram 120 years. We normally see him depicted as a little boy. No, no, he was 20. Could have resisted. And if I ask you again, and I'm going to do this again until you get it right. Who did Isaac represent? I get that all the time. His submission to his father's will was Christ-like, I grant you. But, but he does not, he does not portray Jesus in this. He does not. He is us. Isaac is Israel. And spiritual Israel by extension. And that is exactly the object lesson. That is exactly because it says, And Abram lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him. See, if you stand on the, the Temple Mount there, you go there, quite a few of you have been. You look over the Kidron Valley and you look at the Mount of Olives, which is the hotel in the continent along the top. You can't see on the other side a ram caught in the thorns there, in the thistles. It's too far. But you can when you turn around. You know, Salem was just a stone's throw. You know, Melchizedek, king of Salem, there was just a stone's throw to the south. And he looked behind him. He was facing east, and now he's turning to the west. Did you look at the place that we call you know, today as Calvary? It's hard to say. Was that the near location? No way of saying. But he sees there a ram. A ram is an animal that gets sacrificed for the people, caught in the thicket by its horns. Thicket is a deteriorated form of, uh, of shrub, wood. Wood is humanity. Uh, obviously, the... the, the you go to Genesis chapter 3, thorns and thistles, it will bring forth the, the ground when it was cursed. Remember the reading that? you got to see this. It's really worth it. So he's caught with his horns, planted on the forehead, the intellect. His mind is caught up in the sins of the world. Do you know that if you look at the crown of thorns, and we'll maybe more about that next week, uh, when I'm afraid it's my turn again. I will be preaching on, on just on time. There are aspects to what happened there that we need to know. The crown of thorns, thorns is synonymous with sin. It is round. It's the world. All the sin of the world was placed on his head. In Isaiah 53, it says he offered his mind. Nefesh is also mind, means also soul. And, and, and his whole mind bore the sins of the world. We say that and we don't know the, the, the enormity, the incredible enormity that plays a role here. I would say that the ram that was caught with its thorns in this thicket is really 
a prophecy towards the crown of thorns placed upon his head some 1,800 plus years later. So Abram went and he took the ram and he offered it up for a burnt offering, and this is it, instead of his son. Mount Moriah, the Lord thought that he is a friend, Abram, because Abram was his friend. Friends share feelings, experiences. God taught his friend that he will provide the lamb, as we will see, that's the name of the mountain. He will provide it, as he told Isaac, and God would provide there for himself. And that is what he taught his friend Abram. Abram called the name of the place Yevah Yireh. The eyes to see, it means to provide. Uh, the Lord will provide. The Lord provides. That's what that means. When we see Brothers and sisters, when we really see the provisions that God has made and the cost of it, we will do far more for him. It'll be a delight to run a nominating committee. I don't know where why I started this. We had one just a few months ago, and I was glad when it finished. You got no idea. The struggles we have sometimes. But if we have any perception of what he has done for us, you would be queuing up. You would. If only we have that perception. And so, the prophet Ahijah took a rope, whether it was his or the one of Jeroboam, the one who was going to end up with ten tribes, and he tore the mantle into uh, pieces and this is what he said to his son I will give one tribe that's the son of Solomon Rehoboam that my servant David who already died long ago may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem that means his posterity that was to be on the throne the city which I have chosen for myself notice to put my name there. That mountain, that Mount Moriah, God said, I put my name there. And to put your name there means, um, uh, what shall I say, to express who you are. God expressed his nature. He had totally expressed his nature on that mountain. And the Lord said to Satan, back to Zechariah there, the vision, the Lord rebuke you. In the Hebrew, it really is meaning more like will rebuke you. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem. That's beautiful. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you or will rebuke you. What he's saying, there is Satan the accuser. He has done everything to make this people sin. He has, he has been successful in that. And he might have been very successful in your life as well. And then he is accusing you before God. That's what he does. Nasty piece of work, if I may say it in popular terms. That's what he does. The Lord rebuke you. He's told to back off. If this not a brand plucked from the fire. I like that. Jerusalem was destroyed. But it is going to be saved because it's going to be rebuilt. Because the temple is going to be fully functional again. And it was so four years later. It's magnificent what happened here. God will never, God will never defend the sins of his children. But he will always defend his children. You remember that. I think it's important. And he answered and he spoke to, those, spoke to those who stood before him saying, take away the filthy garments from him. Uh, this, is, this is fantastic. The filthy garments are your exterior. It's what you see. It's your, it's your lifestyle. It's, it's how you have behaved. Those are the garments, the filthy garments. Take the filthy garments from him. Take away the filthy garments. We didn't say, and I like this comment, 
He didn't say take the filthy sinner away because the sins that were perpetrated by Judah were immense. To him he said, see I have removed the iniquity for you. Here is a key thought. The ones who remove the iniquity from you, the only one who can do it is him. He is the only one. I will close you with rich robes. This is the robes of righteousness. And then I said, and then I said, this is Zechariah getting into the vision, and he speaks in the first person. Let him put a clean turban on his head. You know what was written on the turban? Does anybody know what was written on the turban on the head of the, of the high priest? Does anybody know? Holiness to the Lord. Indeed, Kodesla Yavah. That is it. Holiness to the Lord. So they set a clean turban on his head. They put the clothes on him. The angel of the Lord stood by. The angel of the Lord employs, employs the people, the resources of heaven to do his work of salvation. And he stands by. He's in control. Signifying that the transgressions had been pardoned and that he was qualified to function in his holy office. Priest and people were restored to divine favor. There is a divine example in the Old Testament where God many times takes those who repent and uses them in his service. I think that's important, that we understand that. Very important. Thus says the Lord host, if you walk, it's conditional. Restoration is conditional. If you walk in my ways, if you keep my commandments, you shall also judge my house. Likewise have charge of my courts. I will give you places to walk among those who stand here. Those who stand here, this must be most likely be a heavenly scene. It's amazing. It's amazing that the ones that are looking at us that we don't see, one day we will walk with them. Imagine walking with the angel that was ascribed to you for protection. Guardian angel, if you like. I hope he doesn't remember everything. But it'll be wonderful to converse with that being. Be wonderful. Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, that's his fellow workers, for they are a wondrous sign. It is amazing. What is a wondrous sign here? What is a wondrous sign is what God can do in your life, how God can change you. If you ask me, how do I know I, he lives? We talk perhaps more about that next week. He has to be alive. The changes in me, the changes in so many people that I know, and that would be perhaps you as well, the changes that are brought in us, we could have never done ourselves. If only we realized that. We may have a code of ethics, we may have a, uh, a paternity to, 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 to morality, but changes to change a person takes God. For behold, I'm bringing forth my servant to branch. The messianic statement here is that the Old Testament points to one person. They all point to the one that was going to come. God becoming man. No doubt about it. Prerequisites, repentance, sorrow for sin, turning away from it, confession, if we confess our sins, you know this text, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and then what? Oh, I love that, I love that. Oh, learn this. I did the 10 times I've read this text and he comes good on his promises. He does every time. God offers freedom to those who admit the slavery. He does, he does. I love the 51st Psalm. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. I acknowledge my transgression against you and you only. He knows I have sinned. Behold, I was brought forth iniquity. 
purge me with his up and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. You know, this is a magnificent psalm. David was for who he was. He had his faults, but he was a man after God's heart. And there is the explanation why he was a man after God's heart. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. When you look at it, wash me. God is the washing, cleansing me. God is the cleansing, purge me, wash me. I repeat it again. Create in me and renew in me. Renew in me a new heart. He can make you whole. Absolutely whole. It's like a fracture. That's a fractured fibula. And uh, when you come back, once it's set, the ossification, the calcification finds place, it's stronger than the rest of the bone. Much thicker. That is when it happens, when you make mistakes and you learn from your mistakes. Just a very brief little flashback that I come across sometimes. I read this some years ago. The people that you see here, that just come off that, what, if you call that a train, are not Palestinians, they're Jews. We have an enormous paradox. They were dehumanized and they were terribly treated. Uh, if you look at a photograph like that, uh, more than half of them go straight into the gas chambers. That's the children and the elderly. Everybody else that is capable of work will be, uh, be kept. There is, uh, does anybody, can anybody read that, what's on, the, on that gate there? You know what it says? In German. Arbeit macht frei. That, of course, is not true. I want you to have a look at that word, Arbeit, which is the first word that you would read. Have a look at the B. Do you notice something of that B? It's turned upside down. Do you notice that? The ones that were already enslaved there in those camps and that made that, that gate and the, the writing on it, did that on purpose at great risk and got away with it. It was a silent objection and protest of the mistreatment that they received. It's interesting. Auschwitz-Birkenau, lest we forget. You know, I grew up with these stories and you should never forget what happened. Because what happens in Gaza is unbelievable. It's, we're not here to take sides, but we're here to condemn the dehumanization that finds place. There is no excuse for it, and there is no entitlement to do that at all, not by any party. Now, this man here, his name was uh, Oskar Grunig. This is probably 2014 that we deal with the issue here. He's 94, and he's recognized, found out after decades of living a normal life, that that was him. And that photograph, as from now, he would be about 80 years old. If you look at the uniform, you see the SS. Uh, I know all the stories. And he was, uh, he was the, uh, the accountant of the uh, concentration camp because when the people came in, uh, they were obviously searched, stripped naked and what have you. And, and, and he dealt with all the, the, the valuable items and he would uh, sort it out that uh, he was the accountant and he did that for years. Some 300,000 people went through that. So he was complicit. But Groening admitted moral guilt. It's uh, something that we, we can learn from. He admitted moral guilt, but he felt that uh, it was up to the court to decide whether he was legally guilty. How can you doubt that you're guilty in that system, what it did to humanity? And I found it quite remarkable. I followed quite a few of those court cases that there was a reluctance of guilt so many times. And uh, this lady here, she was from, uh, grew up in Czechoslovakia, that's where she was born, survivor. She showed a photograph, she was a witness against him. 
And in that photograph, her whole family is there as well. None of them returned, only her, she did, lives now in America. She was a strong witness against him. But here is a lady from Romania, Eva Moses Kor. That's uh, her twin sister uh, on the left. She was a witness against him, but this is something amazing. She had the capacity, the incredible capacity of forgiveness. And can you believe it? She walked over to him and she made that gesture to him. God is like that. God is like that. He loves you. He really does. He really, really, really loves you. Never forget that. Look in the mirror in the morning. God loves me. He does. Even if you've been bad the day before. He still loves you. And he certainly wants you home. The past has passed. We accept the unchangeable past. We accept the changeable future. We are not what happened, not according to God. I like our commentary. A new nature is not the product of mortal virtue. The Nicola F. D. S. A. Bible commentary. A new nature is not the product of moral virtue, presumed by some to be inherited in man and requiring only gross and expression. It's much, much, much more than that. The new nature is not merely the product of a desire or even a resolution to do right, notice, or a mental assent to certain doctrines as good as it might be. It is the result of the presence of a supernatural element introduced into man. What you and I need is that supernatural element inside us. That is what we need. Which results in his dying to sin and subsequently being born again. You can't be born again if you don't die to yourself. But don't just die to yourself, be born again. Replace. Life is Christ is an endless hope, folks. Life without Christ is a hopeless end. It's a dead end road. Never let Jesus go out of your life. He's meant to be in it. And so he is our path of hope. He took our guilt, he took our shame, and he gave us a future with him. Be rich, be blessed. We are exceptionally blessed. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for being our Father. Thank you for the price that was paid at Calvary, and as we will prepare next week to contemplate that we may again learn more and have a deeper insight of the incredible love as it was expressed. I pray for everyone here that you keep everybody safe, well, strong, and that you bring us again for worship and study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.